Well, CCDA, you're in for a real treat today, and I am going to ask for your prayers because we have a bunch of speakers and preachers and teachers and writers up here, and they only have 40 minutes. So I want you to pray my strength that we will guide this group. But I told them after wrestling with Democrats and Republicans in the White House and in the Congress, this is no big deal. So. No big deal. But this is really incredible because we have a theme to this year of remembering the past, rejoicing in the present, and reimagining the future. And so it's fitting that we would start with remembering the past. And then, of course, toward the end of the week, we're looking forward to our young leaders helping us to reimagine the future. So I'm going to start by simply uh, introducing our, our panel, starting from right to left with Noel Castellanos. Castellanos. Oh, okay, I am going to stay in the seminar. Okay, and I did promise to uh, practice that. Castellanos uh, is our CEO of CCDA. Then uh, Glenn K. Ryan, who is uh, head of Circle Urban Ministries uh, and a writer of one of the classic books on reconciliation. Um, we have Mary Nelson, who is one of our founders, who also uh, has a story to tell about how to build by building people and not building for them, building with them. So Mary Nelson. John Perkins, our uh, former sharecropper slash prophet of God, and our founder co-founder of CCDA. Of course, Wayne, Dr. Wayne Coach Gordon, also a co-founder of CCDA, and a builder of people in Lawndale Community Church as the founding pastor, a real story to tell about how you walk alongside people and not in front of them. And of course, my only favorite friend, uh, he's, I said he's my only favorite Republican. This is my... And I love Bob because Bob is so real. Bob has written books on what he does, which is rebuild physically as well as spiritually. And I'm thankful to God that he has caused our paths to cross. So what we want to do is jump right in and, and help the panel to understand that uh, two things, just simple ground rules in this, is that if somebody has already said the statement, you don't need to repeat it. Uh, two is that we want to get through this now in about 37 minutes with a couple of Are questions. you saying that we're all a little bit old and we keep telling the same things over yeah. and over, yeah. the same stories over and over, and then we're going to just repeat ourselves? You can't help it. Are you saying that you we're going to keep it. telling the same stories <laughs> over and over? You cannot help it. So let's just start with a couple of questions. I uh, started in a smaller meeting in the airport in 1989, and then you started a formal meeting, I understand. I was not there uh, at Lawndale Community Church uh, with people who had been in ministries whose hearts were bleeding about reconciliation and restoration, and you came together. Why did you decide to come together? It's hard enough to do the work yourself. Well, what was that need that compelled you all to get together? Well, John was traveling the country, and he started, of course, you know, we a often... A couple minutes for you. Okay. We often talk about, uh, you know, John being the Moses and Vera May. John and Vera May are the pioneers of Christian community development. And that's why we are so blessed, uh, you being here today, to be here, to hear John's Bible study this Amen. morning, uh, to hear him last night, and to just be that we still have the person in John and Vera Mae Perkins and then all the Perkins children and family that have lived this out for us. And then John went on the road in, in the mid-70s, early to mid-70s, he started traveling more to tell people about what he was doing and what God had called him to do. And as he was doing that, he was changing lives. Is that people, just as I, I'm on the video mentioned, and he spoke in chapel at Wheaton College when I was a student there. And John just started doing that and influencing so many of us. And then I think as, as we would get together, you know, we often people looked at us like we were crazy. You may have that experience too. If you've moved into... Uh, under-resourced neighborhood, you may have found that uh, your family thinks you're crazy, your friends think you're crazy, 
And we needed a place that we could come together and, and not feel crazy, but feel some camaraderie. And we began to do that uh, as, as we got started. So we call it an association, not an asylum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, what was it that caused you to connect with this body of friends? Well, I think as, as organizations were growing and developing and we were starting programs, uh, we, we received a lot of inspiration from John, but there was a lot of uh, technical issues, a, a lot of need uh, to really uh, be an association, what an association does. I remember John beginning to talk about associations and the significance in the development of this country, particularly in its mm -hmm. commercial and um, you know, industrial development, that all strong industries have an association where people gather together not with competition, but with a spirit of cooperation and help. And I think that's what spawned us to come together. John was in operation to create all of these disciples, but I think how we could then help each other find solutions uh, was why we formed CCDA. And from the beginning to be a place of authenticity where as we were trying to live out our lives, we would then share uh, what we were learning, the good, bad, and the ugly. Okay. Barbara, I would say for, uh, for many of us, we were uh, viewed as a bit strange, raising our families in an inner city environment. And we really needed to connect with others who were doing the same thing and be able to share both the joys and the pains and and uh, how you do raise kids in that environment. And so the connectivity uh, of families uh, became a very important drawing uh, card for us. Amen. Mary. And as you know, uh, relationships have been one of the key components of CCDA. Uh, and I can remember uh, we started at Bethel uh, in 1968. So we, had, we were 20 years old uh, by the time CCDA started and the, the struggle that it is out there when you feel like just this little teeny group of people against the uh, le leviathans of society. Uh, and so you, you, you just thirst for that chance to just uh, you know, let down your hair and talk about what didn't work uh, as well as what did work and then to come back feeling affirmed and filled up and ready to go tackle the next uh, challenge that is there, both uh, by the inspiration of coming together uh, and by the sense of sharing that uh, happened so much in those early days in a special right. kind of way. Well, Noel, in that time, 20 years ago, the argument was between, or the dialogue between blacks and whites, and you, as a Latino, how did, did you feel on the outside, and what brought you on the inside in the circle? I am still on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> no. Now, I think at that one of the things that really is significant, and a lot of people don't know this, is at that very first um, organizing meeting at Lawndale, it, uh, there was a guy, Elazar Pagan, and we got to lift up his name as a real important uh, part of our history, because Elazar, a uh, Puerto Rican brother from New York, but who's working here at Riverwoods uh, Camp out in the uh, in Elgin, uh, uh, Illinois, it, he kind of, you know. I mean, I don't know, I'm not going to like make stereotypical comments, but uh, Puerto Ricans can be a little bit more boisterous than Mexicans, okay? And uh, so El I was really trying to be quiet and just kind of mind my own business, and Elazar was starting a revolution, you know, and he was getting in John's face saying, man, what about the Latinos? What about the Latinos? And uh, to, I think, CCDA's credit, at that very first meeting, Elazar was put on the board. And, and John's mantra has always been, hey, uh, you, you concerned about the Latinos, you know, you're going to have to take leadership for that. And that was the beginning, and I kind of stuck around. A few years later, uh, I came on the board. Uh, the thing that, to me, uh, was so important is that the philosophy I knew even though it was being talked about in the African-American community and, and, and in that, you know, white, black context, I knew it would work in the Latino community as well. It'd be different, but uh, so that, that was kind of my deal. I just said, well, we're going to make it happen. JP, Moses. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the overriding um, value given 
who I am growing up in Mississippi when I did, in racist segregation, growing up in poverty, and then being there, you know, had taken some initiative for my own breaking the cycle of poverty, going to California, getting converted, taking responsibility. Um, and when I got back to Mississippi, I, I could see that uh, other people was not going to be able to set people free. That the people with the problem in the community had to take first responsibility. And so I, I, I read it somewhere, this little Chinese poem that outlined how, uh, how you deal with people. It says, go to the people, live among them, love them, plan with them, learn from them, start with what they know, build on what they have. And we say, as the best leaders, when our work is finished, our task is done, we want the people to say, and the people will say, we've done it ourselves. That's development. That's a little different from just charity, and there is a need for charity in a critical hour of, of life and in a critical problem. But you don't want to undermine the people's dignity. And it, so you have to start with, with them. And when uh, Latino was around me saying, why do we don't have no Latino? Uh, Native Americans said, why we don't have no Native American? Because it was a white thing and a black thing. That's what it was. We, I realized that. But uh, the white folks didn't liberate us. The Civil Rights Movement was a collection of people working together. But primarily, it was Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and uh, Megan Everett and Vernon Damon. All those people gave their life for the, for, the, for the cause and whites and blacks got together and brought it about. So that's what CCDA wanted to be. It, don't sit around and fault people. I would, I, sometime now, I meet black folk and hey, still want to hey. talk about it. Hey, say, John, John, let's, uh, that was a question that I asked. Oh, okay? oh I got the You've answered it. it. But I do have a better question than yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, you're going to a new area. you just gone. Let's yeah, see. yeah, yeah. I'm but, trying to no, get people I to take responsibility. This, but I, I got it. But I think that people think we're totally perfect, right, as an organization, right? After, but for 20 years, there must have been some highs and lows. There's some things that you did really well and some things that you really know were part of the poop pile. Okay, what, what were the things you did really well? Well, I remember those early board meetings when you had to come with your pocketbook uh, ready to pick it out because they would lock the door and say, we need to raise X amount of dollars before we leave this room to keep the organization going. And we would pass around the plate and those uh, checks had to come in or we had to make pledges for that. Uh, so clearly the struggle with the finances, our dreams are always a lot bigger uh, than our dollars. Um, but that never stopped us from dreaming or doing. Okay. Anybody else? Where were some of the highs for you? I mean... This gathering. Mm -hmm. uh, every year, I reconnect with friends across the country. Uh, Mary said it earlier, you know, get invigorated once again with the vision. Uh, spend time with John uh, and just get infected, you know, all over again. Amen. I think one of the things that CCDA really did for me and for my wife Ann and our family is to, uh, as Bob alluded to earlier, uh, it gave us an authentic place to talk about struggles. Um, I think that's the most important thing we've done in CCDA. We certainly don't have all the answers. We certainly don't do it right every day. And, and uh, to have an authentic place that we can talk about who we are, some of the struggles we have, something that's not going on, and support each other. At our board meetings, we spend, you know, probably at least a third of the time, no matter how often, how many hours we're going to be together, whether it's four hours or ten hours or two days, 
A third of the time is spent sharing one another's burdens and struggles and praying for each other. And that authenticity of relationships, I think, moves forward. I happened to be in a restaurant last night with a group from Houston. And I was just, they were talking to me about CCDA, and I said, this is what CCDA is about. The eight of you sitting around this table talking together about life and struggle. CCDA has provided a place for us to do life together. You know, we, when, when John and Vera May's son Spencer died, we grieve that together. Ted Travis, who just sang that beautiful song, who, which I think he sang that song at Lawndale at our very first CCDA conference. Ted went through a time of cancer and praying and healing. And as in, in CCDA, I hope you gather a group of friends. Oh, you know, there's 3,000 of us gathering here in Chicago. So you can't be friends with all 3,000. But my hope and prayer is that you will become and get lasting friendships that when you sit down and talk to somebody from Atlanta and you happen to be from Indianapolis, that all of it, you see each other year after year after year. You met in workshops. You have coffee together that you can begin to share through life. When Ann and I were going through a struggle one time, we went down and spent a weekend with Bob and Peggy Lupton, and they just loved us. And, and people do that for each other. So I, that's our hope, is, is deep relationships with one. Let's get beyond the surface, and let's be real with each other, and, and begin to do life with each other. And I think CCDA provides a way to do that. Great. Bob, That's what's what, been good for me. What has been the high point for you in being part of this group for 20 years? Now? Well, I don't know if it's a high point or a low point, uh, but uh, when I went through my deepest valley of grief in losing Peggy, uh, that was a very, very low point in my life. But uh, more than anyone else, this group lifted me, wept with me, uh, and so in that sense it was a very high point. Mm. And so uh, through those, those ups and downs, this has been my, primarily, my primary uh, relation group, people that understood me. And uh, I don't know if that's high or low, but that's real. Amen. Noel? Yeah, I think my experience is kind of like Bob's. Uh, I think every one of us on the board, or probably everybody that comes to CCDA, uh, we've all gone through very deep valleys in our ministries and times of change and transition and times when uh, you, you, know, feel, you feel like everyone's turning against you or you can't do anything right or you're not, you, know, you don't have any money or, you, you know, I mean, all of those, you, you name it, we've gone through all of those things. And the uh, reality that we have people here that are going to walk with us, and I, I really believe I could call on many of these friends that I've gotten to know over 20 years, and if I said, man, I really need you to come and be with me, they would do it. And again, you, you can't do that with everybody, but but I think the, 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 the atmosphere that we try to create for that to take place, uh, in, in, our, in our DVD that we have about the promo of the conference, Barbara has one of the classic lines. She says, uh, we're not here to exchange business cards, we're here to exchange our lives. Now that's pretty good, right? <laughs> so uh, Barbara, you did good on that one. And I, and I think that's, that's really what we're trying to do. You know, I think the important, important takeaway from this is that this just isn't a reality of the founders. I mean, we've just been doing it for a while, but it's something that everybody can enter into. This might be your first time here, and you can be lonely in a crowd. You might not know anybody or just a couple people, and sometimes it feels uh, hard to break in. Uh, but I, this is available to us all because we are all going through or will go through similar issues and the authentic place we want this to be, and I think that we really are, is a place to share. Uh, so don't miss it. Don't sit on the sidelines. Uh, you'll connect with people your age. You'll connect with people uh, your experience. You're a veteran to somebody, and you're a learner to another person. Uh, and that's, that's what's 
um, you know, been so significant about CCDA, and it's available to every person in this room. I think another thing is that over the years, um, the exciting thing is that CCDA has evolved. We haven't stayed static. The three principles, the three R's, uh, even the one on relocation has been enhanced to talk about the returners uh, and the remainers. Uh, it isn't just the relocators. And we've grown from three principles to eight. Uh, and one of the exciting things for me is that we have successfully, uh, and we have to be careful about success, but we have moved to bring in the next generation, the Emerging Leaders Program, and you'll hear more about that, but it's so exciting to have on the board uh, the next generation who are kicking us in the behind and saying, get on with it, keep moving, and let's think new thoughts, and let's try new ways. And we need that uh, to stay alive and to stay willing to change how we do things in a way that's going to be more effective and reach a new generation. Can you all think of some of the uh, issues in the broader community um, that have shaped CCDA to become what it is? Some historical issues, something that's happening in the broader world? And I don't want to dominate this, but I was just reflecting. Uh, the th that's okay, you're a woman, go and do it. <laughs> um, that the thing that got us at Bethel uh, and Bethel New Life uh, active as activists in the very beginning was three days after I got there there were riots in our community and there were riots the next four years and you can't sit around and plan and you can't sit around and do a little program when the streets are burning and people are getting killed right around your church and right around your doorstep so it said we got to move into action we've got to deal with not just the fact that there are riots but what's behind that and how do we move into it and i think that ccda has gone deeper we started out being more programmatic and we're going to do this little after school program and that program but we've gone deeper uh, to deal with the issues not only of the civil rights uh, but of the violence uh, and we're struggling with all these we don't have all the answers but that we're struggling with these deeper issues uh, is an important thing. Amen. But, Glenn. Um, I was uh, challenged again uh, this week by a new uh, board member, Robert Guerrero. It's great to be with Robert because I think he pushes those of us who form ministries basically out of fundraising modes. And uh, that's, you know, that's how we started, raise money from somewhere you know, and put it into the community, redevelopment um, and resourcing our communities. And uh, years ago when I went down to the DR, where Robert's ministry is, uh, I saw a new model uh, of ministry where he, he was raising resources from within this poor community. Uh, and so when you talk about people doing it for themselves and by themselves, uh, to me, it's terrific to see these new models of ministry. Uh, makes you feel real old, uh, but it's terrific to see young people um, forging from the same basic principles, but for, forging new strategies, new ideas. And uh, the beauty is we can learn cross-generationally. Uh, those of us who've been around, there's no model, you know, uh, of how to do it. You know, we all know that the definition of a model is a small imitation of the real thing anyway. Uh, so we can learn from each other. So this new generation, these younger folks who have, have seen how we've done it, are also improving on how we've done it. Well, there's an area where I think there's a great deal of controversy and conflict, and that's in the area of race relations. Um, and I can say this because I'm friends with everybody here, is that we have four of our founders are Anglo-Americans, and there's always been this uh, sense that, you know, whites come into a community and, quote, run things. How have you all not, or have you, maybe you have, but anyway, how do you go into a community and do what John Perkins just said, be, go among them and be, walk with them? How have you done that? What, what lessons can you share with younger people who are, or anyone who's trying to do that? go into a community, an urban community, you're a suburban person, you're a white person, you're going into a Latino community, what lessons can you share about that? <laughs> uh, 
I guess I am white. I'm not suburban. But I'm, I'm, I grew up in Iowa, so there's more people That's in the city the limits of Chicago of than the whole state of Iowa. But anyway, um, well, I think, I think the principles of Christian community development are trying to get us uh, not to be paternalistic, not to come in with all the answers. Uh, one of our key components is listening to the community, mm -hmm. or as we used to call it a little bit, the felt need concept. In mm -hmm. other words, as we uh, sense God's call to move into problem areas, which is a part of who we are, the incarnation, relocation, living in the community is based on the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that Jesus didn't stay up in heaven, but he relocated, he, he became flesh and dwelt among us. And so by moving into communities and living in communities and then listening to the community, not coming in with an agenda, not coming in with how you think something needs to happen. And, and at Lawndale, you know, for us, our story was a very simple one. Ann and I had, I, we were both teachers and we were, had Bible studies with our young people and they had this idea to start a church. We didn't want to start a church. That was not our goal. But... As we listened to them, both her Bible study group of girls and my Bible study group of guys had the same idea. And so all of Lawndale, really, everything that's happened in Lawndale has been an idea of the people of the community. And as we've listened, then we've been able to use some of the abilities that we have to bring resources. So I think one of the key components of Christian community development, or there are two of those that really matter, is living in the community is such an important part of it. But then I think secondly, listening, not coming in with our own agenda. Now, that doesn't mean that we always do that. Sometimes, you know, I get ahead of the game and I start, no. uh, you know, I, I suffer from white man's disease like Bob does. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, which Why often means we Bob think we have it? the answers. But I've learned from you, Bob, and when I watch you do something, I do it the opposite and it seems to work. <laughs> All right, it's good. on now. Uh, I think if you do relocate into the community, make the community your own, raise your family there and uh, participate there. Uh, you inevitably expose your life to a deep level of brokenness. There are just a lot of broken lives. Uh, I know the fashionable term is under-resourced community, but our communities have a lot of broken people and broken lives. And if you make those folks your friends, I mean, in genuine, authentic relationships, you enter into that uh, those issues and then you begin to see God among the people uh, and then as you live life as John talked about you too will experience brokenness within your family you know tragedy loss failure those sorts of things uh, and you have an opportunity to, uh, to be uh, you know to enter into their pain the people in the community and for them to enter into yours and when you, have been, when, you, when you have been around a while and kind of shown yourself to be authentic, mm -hmm. and that happens, there's a bonding there that transcends race in the deepest way. Uh, and when you can cry together, uh, when you can hold each other up, uh, when you can bury mm. each other's children, and spouses mm, praise uh, God. Praise God. transcends all the rest of this damage and garbage. Amen. Transcends it. Amen. But that's sharing life. Amen. Right where we are. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would. I'm sorry, Mary. Please, Mary, go ahead. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons why moving into the community has uh, is so essential or such a high value uh, is that uh, you become vested very quick. Uh, you, you buy a house or a piece of property, you put your kids in a local school, uh, you look for a place to shop, all of those practical things, and self-interest starts to take over immediately. You want to see the quality of that education change because your kids are in that school and you want to see 
a better store come into the community because you don't want to have to keep driving out to the suburbs. And so being vested in the community uh, is, uh, is uh, that self-interest is an important part of what drives you not only to see better opportunities for yourself, your kids, your family, but also all your neighbors. Yeah, Mary? Well, I was just going to say the uh, authenticity. You know, folks in our neighborhood have great phony detectors. And they can tell in a minute whether you're a do-gooder uh, or whether you think you're better than they are. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, being authentic and, and being vulnerable, the wounded uh, healer. But the second is humility. Um, I think, you know, the arrogance of power and we kind of are grow up as white folks with this sort of arrogance of power. And we, we have to learn a great sense of humility that we live in a racist, uh, segregated kind of society where there are these divisions and we have to have a great sense of humility uh, to learn and to listen and to step back, uh, giving leadership by stepping back. Yeah. John, let me ask you a question. Um, there has been a, um, a kind of struggle uh, with going forward. How do we get past the baggage of racism? How do African Americans forgive whites and whites, you know, accept responsibility for the past, move together, embrace the Latinos, Asians, Native Americans, so that we really can become the beloved community? It's great bringing young people in, but how do the people who are still living over 30 get it? How do we get past the past? I, th I think the, the moving in and taking responsibility, uh, getting the, developing deep friendship, making the people need in the community of their own. And I think it's out of that struggle, um, I, I think is what we call patronizing is when the, the, the white person or so is there and have all this friendship outside the community and don't really need the community. What, I've, what we've talked about here is, is pain that money couldn't solve. I mean, Bob couldn't, money couldn't solve Bob's problem. Money couldn't solve my problem when I lost Spencer. Money can't solve those kind of problems. We've got to get into really, of into real life, deep life together. And I think when you become a friend, uh, that's when you, you move forward. Okay, but I'm gonna push you a little bit. Racism is still a reality. With all of that being said, how do we get uh, our, you and I are African-Americans here, our white friends to enter in that struggle or for Latinos to get us enter into the immigration struggle. How do we, we, lo we can love each other, spend time together, hang out together, get to know each other's children, but how do we enter into that battle that's real, that's real in our lives? How do we do that? I, th I think in and, I hear you. I think it's in and into uh, real deep life. Uh, um, and, and, and calling your friendship to a deeper wall. Um, I don't allow my people to call my friends who help me donors. I like to, for us to be partners and friends. I'm not out fundraising. I'm out making friends. I, I, I think it's these deep needs, meeting each other at painful deep needs is what happened. I think that that ought to be the idea of that we are created in the image of God. Uh, it, it ought to be the, the depths of humanity uh, that, that, that gets us past uh, racism. And for me, it has been those people joining with me. Those people joining with me. I depend on my friend. I, I expect them to be my friend. You know, you know, and I expect when they have problems, they're expecting me to be their friend. And then, with me, it was to endure the damage and the pain and the real pain of racism. Most of you folks are talking about 
stuff today ain't nothing. If you've been in prison and been beaten and saw your people kill and saw the racism was a result of that, uh, you're going to get a little deeper. Most of this stuff is just showcasing. Most of it is, is like me wearing this dashiki to identify with the African, you know, people. That ain't nothing. I, I have to, I think I'd jump in there that uh, while Amen. I think that's true, one of the things that is uh, where, where that reality is there it is, is in the, the treatment of many immigrants today, you know, because when you talk about prison and deportations and you talk about um, what families are struggling with, uh, we're, we're going to hear young people uh, tell their stories this week that, uh, you know, they've been here in this country all their lives. If, if somebody says, you know, go back to your country, well, they don't have a country to go back to because this is where they've grown up. They speak probably better English than Spanish. Uh, they, they've uh, given their whole heart and soul to the community, to their neighborhoods, to this nation. They're ready to really become part of this country, but they're here because they, uh, you know, they were brought here by their parents, let's say. They are in danger of uh, being deported, of not having any of the future. Think about our philosophy. Develop indigenous leaders and what if you can't do that because of person's legal status, okay? So I, I, I think that uh, one of the things that I would say um, that's helped me is um, being a part of this movement, what, what it, it has helped me to do is to be not just about Brown, okay? It'd be easy for me to say, oh man, I'm just all about Latino. But you know what? As a Christian, I'm about everybody, everybody's pain. I, I hurt when I, when I hear about a, a, a white suburban family who are caught up in materialism and, you know, alcoholism and all of that is tearing their family apart. That breaks my heart. We need to care about that. I've had the pleasure for the last three, four years to be a part of Lawndale Community Church. That church, with mostly African American, that's my family. You know, that's my church family. I have, I've learned to love the struggle and understand the struggle of the African American community in a way that I never would have been able to do so. I live in the Mexican community, I see that, and I tell you, I, I believe that uh, real uh, a reconciliation has to be connected to justice, okay? And if we just talk about loving and being nice and all of that, I think we're, no one's gonna really take us seriously. I think connecting our message to justice uh, and, and, and working for the well-being of people in whatever situation they're in. I think that's going to carry uh, a great uh, sense of power. Okay, we got about three minutes, so. Barbara, I think the, the two issues that I see that race has morphed into, I, I, you know, the, the hardcore wearing the sheets burning the cross race, you know, that's no longer socially acceptable. But racism has morphed and institutionalized, and one of the experiences is immigration. The other is the incarceration of three million people, largely black and Latino. And this is an issue that is not framed as a civil rights issue, but I think we're missing it in, in big ways. Now, there are some black leaders uh, who are beginning to uh, address this issue, but I challenge everybody to read the book called The New Jim Crow uh, that articulates how Jim Crow has morphed into the um, in system of incarceration and we now see racism institutionalized, set aside, set away, and the political framework is in law and order, but it's impacting us in uh, devastating okay. ways. I gotta jump in here for a second because we are down to about a minute or so. Um, in the future, we're going toward the future. What, would it, what is it that you would like to see? Just take a second each on that, or one or two of you. What you'd like to see going forward? You've been part of this. It's your baby. It's almost grown. What do you want to see? I better let Wayne take you out. JP. I, I, I think our leadership program and bring in um, uh, that new leadership, this young leadership, onto our board right now, you know, of our uh, leadership program, we brought four or five of those young leaders onto our board where they can help make decisions 
right now. And so we need, they, they, they got more information, they can process information better. Uh, I think we, that we need some of us with stability, but, but we need to follow, bring them on, and, and, and we follow them in leadership and using our character to restrain them, uh, not just <laughs> our character. They believe in us, they love us, and restrain them on the basis of that. We are out of time. Let me say one thing. You've got, uh, we're, we're out of time. So can I please say wanna, one thing, Barbara? You still want to go ahead, right? One, okay. one moment. All right. One, of the, one concern I have is that doing what we're doing in CCDA is becoming a little bit of a fad. And that it's, it's popular a little bit to get involved with the inner city and to uh, some justice issues right now. And you know what? The fad just won't do it. Okay. It's not going to get us anywhere. And so okay. we have been saying in CCDA, all of us up here have been doing this for 30 years plus. We've been saying that if it's really going to make a difference, when you go and relocate into a community or you are raised up as an indigenous leader in your own community, Tom Skinner taught me years ago, you've got to stay at least 15 years. Stay at it. Don't get so discouraged. And CCDA is where you come together and that we want to support you. We want to walk with you so you can go back to your community. But don't let it be faddish. Don't let it be the, the, the wave of, of, of the church for a moment to think about justice issue. Let this be a way of life. That's my concern for our future. That's a great way to end it. Let's give our panel a, an applause. Thank them for their time, and thank you so much. <laughs> you can't help. You can't, you can't help.